But uh, what I want to what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the gift of salvation. And there's a reason that I want to talk about the gift of salvation. I'll get to that reason here in a minute. But how many of y'all have ever gotten like a, a Christmas present, a birthday present, Father's Day present, Mother's Day present, whatever occasion that you may receive presents, you open up that present and you have no idea what it is. How many of y'all have gotten that present? Yeah, I have. You have no idea how to use it. You have no idea what in the world you're looking at. So what, the, what happens there is it makes that present unuseful. Now, the gift of salvation is always useful. However, what I've been noticing more and more, unfortunately, I, I looked at Facebook the other day. I, I really try not to do that because it just gets me, gets me boiling. But what I have noticed is I have noticed a lot of people that proclaim Christianity, proclaim salvation, proclaim to be partakers of this precious gift in which we have been given, do not even know what the gift is. And that is evident through their words. Because they are turning it and twisting it into something that salvation is not. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about salvation, what it is, and why it's so great. Now, if uh, you turn in your, your Bibles to Acts chapter 26. And I'm going to read this entire piece. Of, not, not all of it. I'm going to read 12 through 32. And I'm reading uh, this big chunk of scripture for a reason because there's so many lessons once again Paul you know Paul Paul's a pretty smart guy kind of knew what he was doing but uh right here this is Paul Paul has already been held captive for no reason whatsoever actually we'll see that at the end of the, the scripture that I read so I don't mean to be a spoiler but oh well um uh, but you know Paul has been held captive for absolutely no reason and he comes before Festus and Festus really is just looking for a bribe. And then there's Augustus, who is the, the Caesar Augustus, Herod Augustus II. And he's standing before him. And Herod, although he is Roman, he understands Judaism because he's had to deal with Judea, the, the Jews in Rome for such a long time. His dad before him was Caesar. And then he became Caesar. So he actually grew up seeing not only the Jews, but seeing the life of Christ and understanding this transformation that was going on. And Paul, always cognizant of, cognizant of where he is and what the situation is, handles it beautifully. So I want us to see the entire situation and understand the background of what Paul is going through. And as we get through there, we're going to be able to see some things about salvation that a lot of us, a lot of folks that, that claim Christianity, choose to ignore. And it, with verse 12, it starts, In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who are you persecuting? But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn away from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's Paul giving his testimony. So there he is, standing in front of Festus and Augustus, and he is sharing his testimony. He is saying, you too, look at what happened to me. Look at the change that took place in me. Because both of those men are fully aware of Saul before he became Paul. Both of them are fully aware that Saul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That Saul was a rounder up of Christians. That Saul was a denier of Christ. So something spectacular had to happen in Saul's life for this transformation. And what he's doing right here is he's filling in the gaps 
for Festus and Augustus because they knew who he was, they know who he is now, but they didn't know how he got there. Well, each and every one of you, and this is completely separate from the sermon, but each and every one of you is blessed with that gap filler in your lives. There's people that are going to look at you and say, oh my goodness, that is not the same person that I knew five years ago. Oh my goodness, what has happened to so-and-so? Why are they being kind? Why are they not doing dope? Why are they not out on the street hustling? Why are they not homeless? Why are they not blank? You're going to be able to fill in those blanks with your personal testimony and your personal story involving Jesus Christ and what he has done in your life. So there's a part of the lesson. Put it in your back pocket because that's not what we're going to talk about this very moment. But we'll get to it. And then it says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared those to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and all throughout the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I've had the help that comes from God. So I stand there testifying both to small and great, saying nothing what the prophets, but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. That Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. So now he's also not only defined his testimony, what he's defined is he's defined why he's doing what he's doing. Because yes, what he was doing was causing a bit of a ruckus in the synagogues. What he was doing was causing a bit of a, rust, a ruckus in the cities because they said that he was being a heretic. They said that he was, uh, he was discrediting God. They said that he was portray a false prophecy. And what he did was he brought to their attention what I'm doing is not disobedient at all. As a matter of fact, what I am doing is of a greater order than the things that you were doing before. I have my orders directly from God. Jesus Christ has given me these orders directly. Therefore, I am not being disobedient and you will find no guilt in me, but I will stand before you and I will defend what I am doing to the death. Which he did. And he goes on. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things, and I speak to him boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I will it to God that not only you, but all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with him. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul knew that he wouldn't be set free because he appealed to Caesar. Paul knew that he was going to be imprisoned because of his faith. But Paul was instructed to take this holy word to Rome and to do the things that Jesus had instructed. Now, there's a lot of things going on in that piece of scripture. There's a lot of meat there for us to understand and for us to see. But the first thing that we have to see is what is demonstrated in verse 29, where Paul says to him, and Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me might become such as I am, except for these chains. Such as I am. What did Paul mean by such as I am? 
Did they mean, did he mean that they all may grow up to look like him? Did he mean that they may all grow up to have table manners like him? Did he mean that they all may grow up to be sharp-witted? Did he mean that they would all get an education? Absolutely not. He meant that each and every one of them would be partakers of the salvation that Jesus Christ has to offer. Now, salvation is the gift that we're here to talk about. We don't want salvation to be the gift that you get on Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, that you open up and you have no clue what it is. We don't want your salvation to be a gift that you don't know how to use. We don't want your salvation to be a waste of time. We also don't want your salvation to be a false proclamation of the love of Christ. So the first thing that you have to understand is that God's grace is the only condition of your salvation. Your salvation hinges on God's grace. Now this is backed up in scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. Titus 3, 5 and 7. Romans 5, uh, 4, 5 and Romans 11, 29. All of those verses have to do with that. But Jonah, all the way back in the Old Testament, had the proper understanding of salvation. In Jonah 2 verse 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I cannot give you something that is not mine. I cannot give you what belongs to someone else. So salvation belonging to the Lord means that the Lord is the only one that can issue the salvation. This is where we start to get things twisted. This is where we start to see things backwards. Because all of a sudden we receive this great gift of salvation and we take it upon ourselves to decide who can receive it. We take it upon ourselves to decide what the conditions of this gift are. We take it upon ourselves to alienate and eliminate people from God's army. It's not ours to give. If you feel like you have an additional condition that should be added to salvation, God don't care. Your opinion is invalid at that point. And quite frankly, your opinion really doesn't mean a whole lot to me either. We are not the givers of this gift, so we can't decide the conditions that it comes from. This gift is not like a gift that you receive on a birthday, on a marked day, on our calendar, which we can say you deserve this gift because of your birthday. It's not a graduation gift that you get because of some works that you've done, some things that you put on paper, some grades that you've received, and you walk across the stage. No, this is dictated by the Lord himself. Your salvation is his to give. It's not yours to give. It's not yours to determine. It is his, and he will give it as he dictates. And we have to understand that. And if we say otherwise, or we portray otherwise, or we put otherwise out there, we are making ourselves look like fools. We are driving people away from the church, and we are not doing the very things that we've been commanded to do in Matthew 28. We are doing quite the opposite. We are not making disciples. We are alienating disciples. We're eliminating disciples. We are completely ignoring what God told us to do. The second thing that we have to understand is faith is how we attain our justification. That's a lot right there. Faith, justification, what? No, the only reason that we have to go to heaven, to experience this life eternal that salvation promises us is the faith. Faith and grace. We cannot be justified unless we have faith in Jesus Christ. Now again, this is completely backed up in Scripture. John 3.16, how many of y'all know what that says? There you go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Acts 13.39 And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything which... You could not be freed by the law of Moses. Romans 3, 21 through 23. 
But now righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption of Jesus Christ. There's three words that I want you all to pay attention to there. Three important words. Whoever, every one, all, all who come to have faith in Jesus Christ, all who believe in his name, everyone who calls upon him is going to be a partaker of the gift of salvation. That means that it is not dictated by gay or straight. It is not dictated by black or white. It is not dictated by rich or poor. It's not dictated by Democrat or Republican. There is no earthly condition that will keep someone who believes in Jesus Christ from salvation. Does it mean that there are not sins that are barriers in our lives which we attain salvation? Absolutely not. Those sins will be worked through by faith in Jesus Christ. We can say that we've seen people who battle with homosexuality come to know the Lord and come to be a new person. We can say that we know people that have battled the sin of addiction and have come to know the Lord and have become a new person. We can say that we know people of all races, all genders, all backgrounds that know Jesus Christ and have come to salvation and have become new people. To put Jesus Christ in a corner and say that only this person or this person is worth the salvation is discrediting the atoning work that he did on the cross. Hallelujah. To say that his blood cannot atone for a certain sin is to say that his blood and his sacrifice wasn't enough. To say that we can restrict them is putting ourselves above God and making ourselves idols. And if you want to hear about that, go back to the Old Testament. And while we're talking about all, hold on a second. Didn't the scripture say that all of us are sinners and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God? So to say that all sinners are going to hell, well, you're going with them because you're a sinner too. You are not any better than the sinner because you're a sinner as well. The moment that you weaponize your salvation, you are discrediting the very work that Jesus Christ has done. The moment that you make yourself better than someone else because of your salvation, you are ignoring what Jesus Christ did while he was here on earth. The moment that your salvation becomes something that you dangle over someone to suppress them further, you need to question your own salvation. And you need to question your own walk with the Lord. Because obviously there's a disconnect there. Obviously you're not seeing what Jesus Christ intended you to see. And it's backed up by the scripture. This is an unmerited gift. This is a gift that you have been given by His grace. Not because you're a great person. If you were to get what you truly deserve, your life would not be anything like what it is today. I know that we all have problems, but if we truly got what we deserve, how would our lives look? If we truly, truly got what was merited, where would we be? If we truly received from God what it is that we put out there, what would our lives look like? I know my life would look like destruction. My life would look like pain. My life would look like an earthly hell. But thank you, Jesus, for the grace that you poured out upon me and allowed me to be a partaker of salvation because I do have faith that your blood was enough to atone for my sin. I do have faith that what you did here on earth was for a reason. I do have faith 
that you will see me through every other thing that I will face in this lifetime. And Lord, I thank you also because you have already forgiven me for the mistake that I'm going to make later on today. The mistake I'm going to make tomorrow. The mistake I'm going to make on Wednesday. The mistake I'm going to make on Friday because I make them every single day. And so do you. Do not put yourself in a room with no mirrors. Look at yourself before you put stuff out there. How are you portraying Jesus Christ in this gift that you've been given? The next thing that I want you to understand is that like any other gift, salvation is worth sharing. I received a gift not long ago, a gift of my, my beautiful white truck out there. And I like to share it with everybody because I love that truck. I do. It's a wonderful truck. But it's nothing compared to my salvation. Now, like salvation, I can't give you my truck. I'm not going to give you my truck. But I can show you my truck and you can go out and find a truck like it. No, but I can show you Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is there for you immediately. You can receive the same gift that I've received. I can't give it to you, but I can show it to you. How in the world am I going to show you the gift of my salvation? I can show it to you with my words, but my words are just words. Because what we've learned about words is words don't really mean a whole lot. Words are just empty unless they have action behind them. Amen. So the best way for me to show you the gift of the salvation that I have received is the life that I live. The things that I do. The way that I talk to people. The way that I handle myself around people that are different than me. The way that I show the joy that Jesus Christ has put into my heart. And each and every one of you have the power to do that. See, that's the thing about words and actions is... We can be the determiners of those. Jesus Christ gave us the gift of free will. Free will can be a gift or we can turn it into a curse just as quickly. So use your free will to glorify God. Use your free will to exude the joy that you have in Jesus Christ. Don't use the gift that you've been given and the joy that you have to go on to Facebook and condemn people to hell. It's not your job. And guess what? We all complain about our jobs anyway. We work too many hours. We do too much work. Why in the world do we want to take on the work of Jesus Christ? You talk about a job. My goodness. I don't have nearly enough hours. Don't take on too much. Simply be what he wants you to be. Be what he designed you to be. Allow him to be your director. This gift of salvation is so beautiful and so perfect. And we want to keep it to ourselves and we want to keep it bundled up. But that's not what he wanted us to do. We can see right here. We're getting back to where I was talking about. I told you we'd circle back. Anyway, Paul is standing there, verse 29, and he's saying, not only you, but everyone. I want to see every single person come to know Jesus Christ. Now, I've been a pastor long enough to know that not everyone is going to come to know Jesus Christ. I absolutely realize that. And I realize that there's people that you can see that they're not going to come to know Jesus Christ because you can see the fruit that they're bearing. But I also see people who claim Jesus Christ bearing some bad fruit too. Yeah, amen. But Paul also said something very important there. Whether it be a short time or a long time. Sometimes we just have to work a little harder. Sometimes we just have to express Jesus Christ a little bit more. Sometimes we just have to be like he wants us to be. A little bit more around people. Some people are just tougher nuts to crack. And we can open those doors for Jesus Christ. We can be ambassadors like he wants us to be. We can do those things if we allow him to work within us. Paul realized that he didn't just want Agrippa, but he wanted everyone. Now, Paul could have easily said, when, when Agrippa asked him, will you see me become a Christian? Paul could have easily said, I don't want you to receive salvation. You are a Roman aristocrat. You're not like me. I'm more educated. And I'm better. However, if you'll have your brother call me, he's pretty cool. See, that's what we do. Is we take salvation away from some people. 
And most of the time, it's the people that need the salvation the most. Most of the time, it's the people that are downtrodden. Most of the time, it's the people that have been kicked. Most of the time, it's the people that are truly suffering that we are not necessarily uh, denying it, but we're afraid to offer it to them. We feel like we don't understand their situation. We feel like we may not be able to, to, to talk to them, but Jesus Christ has given us the ability to do all those things. Jesus Christ will transcend the Jesus Christ will outdo you in every instance. And Jesus Christ will allow you to put it out there so that the Holy Spirit can do his work. So don't get it twisted. This gift is a gift from God. And that's what we should portray. We should portray the beautiful gift that we have been given. We shouldn't be dictators of salvation. We should be partakers of salvation and advertisers of salvation. We should show people the salvation that we've received. We should show people this beautiful gift. And we should allow ourselves to be what he wants us to be. And I've got a little bonus here, okay? Now, how many of y'all have heard me talk about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10? Love it. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's my favorite piece of scripture. If you really want to see how salvation breaks down, and you really want to see the way that, that God works in your life and the way that, that you have been saved, read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I am going to read uh, verses 5 through 7. And it says, Even though we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Not only does this gift, see, every other gift that you receive on earth is going to wear out. Eventually, my truck is going to break down. Amen. May not, it's a show. Anyway, <laughs> but eventually, all things on earth break down. Yes. But this is a gift that lasts for eternity. In the coming ages, we will be witness to all of the wonderful things that God has in store. And not only that, he seated us in the heavenly places with him. Think about this. The next time that you want to put out there on Facebook or the next time you want to verbalize that all sinners are going to hell or there's, there's this or there's that or, or whatever it may be, Okay. Think about, one, where you were. Two, think about where you are now. Three, think about Jesus Christ and his time here on earth. Think about the sin that he witnessed and the sin that he dealt with and the sin that he was able to, to rectify by his atoning death. Don't let the gift that he's given you be for naught. Allow him to work in your lives and allow him to show himself through you. Allow others to see how beautiful that gift is. And if you're putting limitations on that gift, you're blinding people to the true glory of Christ. And lastly, it's just not yours. It's not yours to give. It's not yours to take away. And it's not yours to determine. So don't tell Actually, that's Jesus calling. Oh. <laughs> Travis, <laughs> I to talk to you about your salvation. Oh. <laughs> so go out this week and let's be aware of what we're doing. Let's be aware of, of who we're talking to and how we're talking to them. Let's be aware of what people see when they look at us. And let's always, always correct ourselves when we see ourselves going to the You know, I went to the Hay House this week and there were 13 men who fell drug tests. 13. That's a lot. That's a lot. All did it together. And there was, afterwards there was just a, a group of, of men that came down for the service and, and we prayed and we talked and everything else. And, you know, sometimes we see ourselves taking that first step. And we've been blessed with the Holy Spirit. We've been blessed to know right from wrong. And at that moment, we can pray. And we can turn away from that sin. And you know, no sin is greater than the other. So their sin that they committed when they relapsed or when they did that, you know, they can be forgiven for that. 
That's fine. But guess what? It's also a sin to misrepresent Jesus Christ. So catch yourself in that sin. Don't be the haughty. Don't be the one that, 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 that spews ignorance. Because every single time that you do that, you can be rebuked and you can be debunked by Scripture. And there's always someone out there that can do it. So, y'all dig? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for this time that we got to spend together. Lord, we thank you for the joy that you put in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for the, the love that you show us each and every day. Lord, we thank you for the salvation that you bless us with. Lord, Lord, may each and every one of us appreciate it more and more every day as we see you better. As we know you more, Lord. As we get to realize the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. Lord, may we be honest partakers. May we be good advertisers, Lord. May we be true ambassadors of you. Lord, may we always realize that the gift that you have given us is not a gift that we've earned, Lord. It's purely out of your love for us, Lord. And Lord, we know that you have a love for all of your creation, Lord. And may we show that love. And Lord... If your message falls on ears that don't want to hear it, Lord, may we walk away knowing that we truly showed you to those people, Lord. And Lord, if your message falls on ears that are waiting for that message, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if that message just falls on a heart that's crying out for you, Lord, Lord, may you grab that heart. May you pull it into your fold, Lord. And may you bless them mightily, Lord. May they see that the things of old will fade away. May they see that the troubles that they portray in their life will go away because of the love that you exhibited for us since before the beginning of time, Lord. Lord, there's such a comfort that comes with knowing that you are with us, Lord. There's such a comfort that comes with knowing that we are being held by the one true God. Lord, there is such a comfort that comes with knowing that your son, Jesus Christ, came to this earth and died for us, Lord. Lord, there is just such a comfort that comes with this gift of salvation. Lord, let us be partakers and not abusers. Let us go out and love the way that you have instructed. And Lord, we pray that if there's anyone here today that does not know that love, does not know that comfort, does not know that peace that comes with you, Lord, that they say this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins, Lord. Fill me with the Holy Spirit till it overflows, Lord. Come into my heart. Lord, I know that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to live, suffer, and die for me, Lord, and to atone for the sins that I could not possibly atone for myself, Lord. And on the third day, he rose, giving me a new life, a life eternal with you, Lord, a life full of blessings that I have yet to receive. Lord, I know that he now sits on your right-hand side as my advocate, Lord. And I know that there's nothing that you don't understand. I know that there's nothing that I can go through that you can't help me with, Lord. And Lord, I give myself to you, mind, heart, body, spirit, and soul, knowing that I'm saved. Lord, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen, amen. Jasmine's going to bless us with another song. Yeah. During this time, if, if you said that prayer, and you know, even if you didn't say that prayer, let's we'll say that you feel this tugging on your heart later, and you're like, this feeling is weird. And you're like, what am I supposed to do? You don't have to say that big fancy prayer. You can just say, Lord, I'm yours. I know that your son came to deserve and died for me. Thank you for saving me. Because that's what he wants. Is he wants your heart. He doesn't want your big fancy words. He doesn't want your, your big fancy car. He doesn't want your sharp looking jacket. What he wants is you. So give yourself to him. And your life will be blessed mightily. But if you came to know the Lord, please come to the front. Allow us to pray with you. Allow us to, 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 to help you in, in this walk that you have ahead. And if there's anyone here that's suffering, if there's anyone here that needs prayer, if there's anyone that needs anything, please come to the front and let us know so that we can pray with you and we can be with you during this time.